stories, how you use them. T minus three, two, one, zero, and liftoff. Hello, hello, hello. Tom Els with the BizDoc here, the BizDoc podcast. I'm here with Kai Lode and with Kellyanne, who is pulling, she's a Swiss Army knife and she's pulling stats and bringing everything together while we're doing the talking. A lot of things going on. This is what we got going on this week. We have three segments this week, and they look like this. Uh, so we, coming up, we got stats, who's back to work. Only 50% of um, uh, office space is occupied. 10 very interesting business stats. The CEO interview, Harry Dixon, co-founder and CEO of Checkmate, and the BizDoc case study. Those will be our three segments that we got going. And let's start now with the stats. Who's working and who's not? Isn't that interesting? Here's the first chart. The first chart we're looking at is the Census Bureau was putting together uh, information and they put these charts out and put information from time to time. And they have indicated, let's take a look at who's back to work. So on the surface, it looks like our, our workforce is back to normal. You know, we had a change in the the share of work, take a look at this. That big dip that you can see right there is from COVID. And then we've been steadily getting back to work. We had a big bounce up where they let us all get back to work and then a steady growth as restaurants open. And right now we're within 0.3 percentage points of who was working before COVID and who is working now May, uh, June timeframe. This was stats that were compiled right here in second quarter of 2023. So it's really interesting. And Kai, you take a look at this, but who's working is a whole different story, isn't it? Yep. Because it's not the same people working that were working before. So and the, so we dove into the data a little bit. And what did we find first? Yeah, because overarching, the chart looks like it's good, where every, everyone's back to work, everyone or 0.3% less of people are back to work. But I'd say in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty interesting. But once, once we kind of dug deeper in the charts here, we're seeing who really is more back, who wasn't there before, and then who are there now but weren't before on that end. So that's gonna be interesting to see as we, as we dive into this, if you wanna kinda keep this going. Exactly, and the first group, let's take a look here at moms. Very telling. So it looks like we're all back to work. Washington DC, a president, people are saying, oh, everybody's all back to work again. It's the same as it was. I'm a hero, I got everybody working. Not so fast. Let's take a look at what has happened to our labor force because there's some big messages that are below the surface here. Start with moms. Take a look at this. 2.5 percentage points more. So in other words, two to 3% more moms are working now than were working before COVID. And then you have the line there for dads and non-parents. But why would it be that moms are back to work? What's going on? Yeah. When they surveyed them, what was the reason so many moms came back to work? Uh, I mean, obviously, inflation is a big part of it. I think that um, looking at how, how it's gone, the other interesting part I found, too, is that less dads are working in terms of, like, the change there. Obviously, it'd be one thing if it's a two-income parent, two parent household, but also where dads have dipped as well. It's, it's pretty fascinating on that end. Yeah, but let's stay with let's stay with the moms. And by the way, they're saying moms. So the government is saying moms. These are females. I'm not going to go into political correctness and oh, these are birthers and stuff. These are moms in a traditional sense because that's how the census uh, department is reporting them. Then they dive into women in general. Take a look at this. This is a chart looking before and after COVID of women working. And look at what has happened. Here we go. One more. Um, Hello, hello, looking for a chart here. Um, we need coffee for the control room. Double espressos for everyone. Um, we now have more minority women working now than were before, like a full percent of African-American or black women as defined by the Census Bureau are working than before COVID. And they were also talking about inflation and being pushed back to work, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of shocking. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's powerful telling, too, of seeing that overall everyone, when it comes to women, are down, or everyone is, is down 0.3%, and then you have all women are up 0.2%, and then obviously the black women, in this case, up almost one percentage point, which is pretty significant in terms of the grand scheme of things. So it's um, the, the charts are more revealing than we would have thought on that end. 
Yep, absolutely. And you found one more chart, which mm -hmm. was even more startling. And I'm going to let you cover this one because you dug it up. Yeah. And this is our last. This is the last chart on this, which I found to be really startling. Yeah. This is this is the definitely the one with the biggest change on that end. So if they want to pull it up here with the control room. Um, we see that in this chart, there's the people with disabilities versus everyone. So everyone is down 0.3%, which is kind of what the first chart init showed initially, but with disabilities is up 3.1%. And you can even see that they didn't take as much of a stark drop to begin with as well. So like that has consistently hovered over the previous line, the, the baseline on that end, which is pretty startling on that end. What do you think this is by? Well, this is also the people that were surveyed, their number one reason for being back to work, more urgency, and the change in the workforce given was inflation. In other words, it costs more now. Because remember, we're not just talking about 2021 bouncing out of COVID, but we still had a mess. Mm -hmm. 2022, hey, we're getting um, amusement parks, restaurants, things are back open, get back to normal. This is a year later after COVID where inflation has gone up, reared its ugly head, led to the Fed raising interest rates more than at any time, practically at any time in US history. Mm -hmm. And now we're at 30 year high on interest rates. And the inflation that went with that, people are saying it's inflation. So you have people with disabilities that are going back to work, citing inflation. You've got moms going back to work, citing inflation. And you've got mm -hmm. more African-Americans at work citing inflation. So what everybody is saying is it's a much different mix of who's working now. And some of the people that were working part-time are now full-time. And they're saying, hey man, COVID's over, but getting back to work now, I gotta work because inflation has come. Now, you look at the price of a gallon of gas, it's come back down. You look at the price of eggs, they've come back down. Yeah. But everything else in the basket it's at the uh, much supermarket up. has stayed up. Yeah, so even though some of those big levers are what people are concerned about, and especially in terms of the political arena, that's what they're pinpointing to and saying, oh, we're down, we're down, like we're back to normal. But the reality is that the far majority of the goods in the basket have gone up and they have stayed up which at that point, obviously, it doesn't make anything cheaper where people that before could rely on less income because they could get past it with the inflation now are having to pick up extra shifts or get back to work more urgently to take care of the cost of the stuff they have going on on that end. So it's definitely been a significant change on that end. Exactly. And let's take now let's dive in a little deeper because in statistics, it's always good to go from general to specific and to dive in to see what it all means. Here's education. So let's pop up the chart that shows the education curves. And these little curves you see here, these pink U-turns, is before COVID and now after. three years after. Take a look at this. People who did not complete high school, more of them are working now than before. High school, down about a per a percent, bachelor degree down about a half, master's degree down about 1.1, doctorate degree. So the more education you have, the, the less percent you're back at work. That points to the layoffs we've had in professional mm -hmm. industries. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to be laid off from Facebook and all those companies and tech companies that had layoffs. But if you look at the second row, take us through this, Kai. Look at the second row by age group. It yeah. tells a very interesting story, doesn't it? Absolutely. You see, obviously, under 30 is the highest one with, what is it, 14.6 percentage points. Uh, they're, they're down or they're back plus 0.1 percentage point. And then it continues from 30 to 39, obviously down 9.9. Uh, .9. And then they're up 0.9 now. So we're seeing a younger part of the population are definitely more um, in tune with it. And then as you see up to like 60, 69, they're down 0.1% and the 70 plus are down 0.08%. Um, so the older, which kind of makes more sense, they've probably more shifted into a retirement or they've gotten kind of benefit packages or anything like that to be moved out. Um, but the interesting that both of these curves have in common is that the further left, whether that comes to education or age, more of them were laid off, which, which makes me think at least that more of these people are working on the service jobs or anything along those lines where those were the, also the um, 
industries that were hit the hardest by COVID. So they definitely have had more of a bounce back, but they were also the ones that were hit the most, as opposed to the more uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, doctorate degrees and stuff like that, yep. too. So we can thank the U.S. Census Bureau for diving into it and giving us stuff that is accurate through about the end of May, April, May of this year. But it paints a very interesting story that you may hear that we're all back to work, but it's a much different mix. And within those of us that are working, there is people that have been laid off looking for professional jobs that are still looking for jobs. And there's people that have gone back to work from part time to full time moms you know, African-American women and things that are looking for those extra bucks because the supermarket is still an angry beast. Now then, let's look at an impact point. The next stat we've dug up here, the very interesting, this is office space. Now let's take a look at this. Only 50%, now take a look. We were almost 100% office space occupied when COVID hit, when the big thump hit, and that mm -hmm. was, uh, was that February of 2020? Yep. Sports leagues canceled, all that stuff. Yeah, early March. Three years ago, seems so long ago. But at that point, the occupancy rate plummeted as all of America put on a mask and went home. Now look at what's grown back. It's only 50% occupied so what's going on there is this work from home is about to destroy the the market for office space and yeah i think the vaults I th I th on these massive loans i'm sure i'm sure there's a lot of different kind of uh factors that play into this i think a big part of it is obviously they went from they had a larger workforce to then layoffs and they're consolidating and they're saying, hey, we might not need as much office space as we needed in terms of automation of processes, workflows, or adjusting in terms of like, we thought we'd be growing a lot more aggressively and then realizing that, hey, we might not need that extra office to really um, take on more staff and stuff like that. But obviously the work from home, although it's, it's slowly shifting back for sure to more of an office environment, it's gonna be interesting to see how this climbs over time and um, in terms of just availability and stuff like that, too. It's amazing stuff. So anyway, that's what's office space. So you saw it here first. Work from home has had this huge impact on office space. Not all of us are back there. Yeah, there's been a lot of layoffs at the tech companies that we talk about, but that doesn't explain the playing field all across the USA. And those are local banks, community banks, and regional banks that are carrying most of the paper in the commercial office space that's in their towns. And we'll talk more about that on a, another podcast, but that that is about to happen. And you're gonna see headlines of that going all the way to the middle of next year because it's not gonna be pretty. And you can see it right there, started at COVID and we didn't refill that place back up. All right, third, third one today, I like this. I dug this up, this is very interesting stuff. Uh, 10 small business stats. So why don't you take the odds, I'll take the evens. All right. And uh, Kellyanne will cut and paste these and drop them into the comments. That would be great. And um, yeah. also drop, off will drop in the comments the, uh, the website for Checkmate, because we're about to talk to Harry Dixon, one of the co-founders and CEO of Checkmate. So you'll have all that stuff available to you in the comments. So you take the odd, I'll take the even. Yep, so first that is there are 50, 582 million entrepreneurs on earth. So there, wait a minute, there's 8 billion people on earth and one in 16 people call themselves an entrepreneur. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, number two, small businesses make up 90% of all global companies and 50% of the jobs. So if there's a vibrant economy, thank an entrepreneur. Yep. And then third stat is there, there's an estimated 334 million companies worldwide, which then the interesting stat in terms of this, how this correlates with the first one is if there's 582 million entrepreneurs and 334 million companies, then a lot of the entrepreneurs are a one man shop or maybe one two man shop or something along those lines. In incredible. Number four. 50% of small businesses start at home. I guess that's the proverbial garage. Google started in a garage. Hewlett Packard started in a garage. Yep, so I think that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we've heard now, which kind of goes into this fifth stat here, that most people start a business because they want to be their own, or we think most people start their own business because they want to be their own boss. But in reality, only 2% of people are starting a business because they see an opportunity in the market that they can really excel. Is there any, if that's true, only two people start a business because of an opportunity in market, is it any, is it any surprise that in the first two years there's such a high mortality rate for those businesses? Okay, number six, 
44% of small business owners are between 39 and 54 years old. So guess what? They start after they've been doing something. In other words, they've learned something, figured it out, got a little experience in life. And wow, almost half are between 39 and 54. And 2% of those have a, found a market, uh, an opportunity in the market. So we'll see how that turns out. But uh, next stat is that 54% of small business owners have a bachelor's degree or higher. So a lot of them are starting businesses either straight out of school or dropping out of school or something like that as well. Fantastic. And number eight, 56% of small business owners struggle to find suitable employees. Boy, isn't that true. You got to get people that want to come work for a smaller business, a little bit more risk there. And over half of small business owners says, man, I struggle finding suitable employees. Very, very typical. So if that's happening to you, remember, you're not crazy. Just keep working it. Yep. And point number nine, I don't think this is really a surprise to anyone, but small business owners are known for working overtime and long hours. Overtime? I thought it was all the time. Yeah. You know, that's like, my goodness. There's part-timers. Full timers and all the timers. And yep. the, most entrepreneurs, the ones that are successful, the two presenters successful, I guarantee you they're all the timers. And number 10, the number one cause of business failure is low sales and cash flow. So let's go back to the 2% that were actually building something because they knew there was a, something in the market and there was a product they could offer to it. Those guys probably found cash flow and sales. Everybody else says the number one cause of business death is I couldn't sell anything and cash flow ran me out and so I went back to another job. At least for the time being, they could be their own boss. So uh, that's a good thing. Exactly, exactly. Well, speaking of being your own boss, you know, we're gonna, uh, we have a interview with a wonderful CEO coming up in a second, but first, a little word from our sponsor, Heart for Gold. You know, businesses today are facing a rough world. Banks are failing, inflation is never ending, and a looming recession threatens to wipe out stock value, which is bad for business, but even worse for retirement funds. And to make things worse, the government is targeting 401ks and IRAs. With heavy new taxes to pay for social justice agendas, that is bad for your investments because things are being taxed. The good news is there's a way to help protect your financial future investing in precious metals. And do we have the screen for Heart for Gold? Yep. There we go. American Heart for Gold will ship physical gold and silver directly to your door. Or they can set you up with a gold IRA. A gold IRA can shield your wealth from this economic meltdown. And the best part is this method is tax and penalty free. Analysts predict gold is set to hit all time highs. We hope they're right. If you have retirement funds, you cannot afford to lose. You don't always lose uh, value. You also lose time to make up that value. So now is the time to call the only precious metal dealer that I, the biz doc, currently trust, American Heart for Gold. They'll show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. With the finest products, amazing customer service, and a buyback commitment, American Heart for Gold has earned a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. That's right, an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, a very reliable place to check out the quality of companies. So tell them I sent you, and American Heart for Gold will give you $5,000 of free silver on your first order. Click the link that will be posted in the description for the website, Kellyanne's gonna put it there, or call 866-535-0767. That's 866-535-0767. Or text biz, B-I-Z, that's me, biz, B-I-Z, to 65532. Biz to 65532. And American Heart for Gold is ready to take your call and talk to you about their products. Thank you so much, American Heart for Gold. We're very appreciative of your sponsorship. And now we're gonna to go to Harry Dixon. I'm excited about the second segment. And the second segment, we like to talk to CEOs. And we have got another CEO here who's a veteran of a couple startups. that has got a lot that he can share. And it's a very interesting FinTech company that I think those of you who have done shopping online or have attempted to find deals and you have to go so many places, they make that so easy. And so here with us is 
Harry Dixon, who's one of the co-founders of Checkmate, and he's also the CEO. There he is. Hey, welcome. Thank you for being here on the BizDoc podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Well, it's, um, I'll, I'll say a little bit. That way you don't have to do that part for yourself. <laughs> but Checkmate, a smart shopping solution that gathers e-commerce data and helps customers save money. How? Well, by being a sort of a clearinghouse and a dashboard, kind of an extension on your Safari browser mm -hmm. so that you can go out and find coupons, discount codes, or other things that are available because the vendors have those out there because they want you to buy their stuff. And they've got a promotion or they're in the middle of a, a rollout campaign for some you know, apparel and they're offering the sale to get you to check it out and to try it. Well, guess what? Checkmate brings that together so you can find those discount codes and those coupons, take advantage of it, and get the best deal. And then best of all, they keep a little library for you along with reward points. That's Checkmate, and we have Harry Dixon here to talk about that and more. Welcome. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I guess like to add to that, I feel like we want to be ultimately a personalized destination. And so... For Checkmate, that's really where we see aggregation as the, the starting point and then um, really applying all that value as you shop via an extension, which is very new to mobile and we're really excited to you know have launched and now have hundreds of thousands of Americans and Australians, which is you know where my accent from, um, shop with us. So it's been, it's been going well. Yeah, awesome. And your, your co-founders, Rory Garten-Smith and Elliot Rampono, don't want to leave them out, but thank you for being here as a CEO. And what is up right now? Because all startups go through all the phases. What has just happened now? Congratulations on the recent financing. And what is hot and next that you could tell people about who follow it or who should follow it and go add it to their Safari browser and take advantage of it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I appreciate the the congratulations on the on the funding. Um, you know, excited to have Google Ventures join us um, for our Series A, which is fantastic. But you know, we don't talk about it actually that much. But we were fortunate to hit number one in the App Store um, late last year, early this year, um, which was a bit of a wild ride. You know, given the audience is mostly entrepreneurs, um, we were five people as a startup, and we onboarded over 250,000 users in less than a month, um, which for anyone trying to deal with APIs and things like that, it was it was a lot. So, um, you know, excited that we're in the next phase of Checkmate, where we have some resources to expand the team and um, continue to bring like a, a great shopping product. So that's what's happening in our world. Oh, fantastic. So stepping back, you have, this is not your first rodeo, so tell us a little bit about your background. You know, we have the Vault Conference coming up at the end of August. We're going to bring together 3,000 entrepreneurs from 42 countries. These are entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs that maybe are inside companies that are funding uh, pro projects, as well as leaders from all manner of things, COOs that are part of a family business that are coming here. And they all want to know the same thing. How do I do this? And am I crazy? I'm feeling these things. Am I crazy? And so one of the things I like to ask, especially someone like yourself, who's been a, what we would now call a serial entrepreneur, is what were you doing before this one? And then what was the spark that let you to get together with Rory and Elliot and create Checkmate? So let's start with where you were. Yeah, yeah. Happy to explain my background, I guess, for the entrepreneurs in the room. Um, I feel like I've gone up and down the stack from starting my career working for Trimble or, or Frank Gehry, the architect um, at a you know Fortune 100 company, um, realized that wasn't for me. And so, I, um, as mentioned, I've joined a couple of startups, both earlier stage and a bit later. So um, I was the first business hire at Skyrise, which is an autonomous helicopter company that we're launching an end-to-end -end air shuttle route. Um, we started in, L in LA, launched multiple air shuttle routes, um, hired 70 people. It was um, pretty insane. Ultimately, the business decided not to continue with the consumer service. They're still building autonomous systems. Um, but that led me to my e-commerce background and career at a company called Easy Post, a multi-carrier shipping API. Uh, I started in strategy. And ultimately, when COVID kicked in, if you're not building product or you're not selling, um, you're replaceable. And so I moved over to the partnership side and um, ended up uh, leaving as uh, director 
um, of partnerships there where I mostly focused on infrastructure. And so infrastructure in a multi-carrier API, which means that if you're a business like a Warby Parker or a Walmart and you need to send something to a, a consumer, you get to, to normally choose your shipping option, either one day, two days or, or whatever you want to choose. They need to ask the carrier um, like a FedEx or a U USPS to do that. So the infrastructure side is built around like Shopify, Magento, WMS management software. So I spent a lot of time in the e-com infrastructure space. And so when I was starting to think about Checkmate and I had a lot of observations around the macro market of I'll call unbundling um, of e-commerce, which I can explain a little bit, but um, you know, my partnership skills um, ultimately combined with Rory and Elliot's um, software engineering skills. Rory was at Apple, Elliot was at Data Robot. Um, it seemed to be a match made in heaven, both on um, culture, but uh, on on really the kind of complementary skills. So that's really the inception and have to explain on, on some of the observations if that's helpful, Tom. Well, what's very interesting about that is most of the entrepreneurs that I've mentored or that I've met come from one of two areas. Actually, I would say about 90% are come from one of two areas, product or business development. And business development, people see markets, they see a crevice in the market, they see a place to build a bridge across the crevice and make a product out of that. Or they come from the product side and they believe a certain market space could benefit from this product. So they go looking you know, for the deployment point that's in there. But it's usually product or business development and the business development people who are good product strategists. And I find it e interesting that you said that you were working in strategy and then in partnership. So you've come right along what I would call the business development lane in your entrepreneurial journey to step out, which I think is very typical. Um, and very, when I say typical, I mean, that's a, that's a very, interesting path but it's you've earned as we say in the military the stripes on your shoulder and your rank of what you've built there you know now as being the ceo how different has it been an experience for you to being the ceo of an organization when you're really in the early days probably also wearing the chief business development officer hat how have you segregated that so that you can drive the organization and get momentum because most entrepreneurs find out that over time, they can't be both. They can't be the CTO or the chief product officer and the CEO founder, or they can't do both. Have you encountered that milestone and how have you managed through it? Yeah, um, no, it's a very typical issue. Um, for me, I think like the product and business development side, I wouldn't call myself a, a, a product um, leader in the sense of the day-to-day product, I think a lot of the strategy that was learned from Easy Post was really at a macro observation level. And so, you know, I can communicate where I see value and opportunity, um, but really need to rely on um, on your business partners, which has been Rory and Elliot. And then since then, we've brought phenomenal people like Cody and Matt and a whole wide uh, range of, of other people that augment those. So, um, you know, shifting kind of hats, you have to have inherent trust. And so that's you know, hard to kind of give your baby away in the sense of like product ownership, but it becomes a lot bigger than myself and Rory and Elliot even. Um, you know, Checkmate is not our company. It's it's a it's all inclusive in our Checkmate family. And so that's definitely moved as we've grown bigger and we've hired more people. So um, really kind of letting the reins go and giving people um, you know, earned trust has been a big shift because it is your baby um, after all. So uh, that's a big, big learning for me. Unpack that a little bit. When you say giving trust, I assume you mean you've got your core team, you're treated like a family, mm -hmm. then you were 12 people, and then you have to bring someone in in some function. But you got to be able to trust them. It's not just a back end or a front end engineer. It's somebody that's got a realm of responsibility, and you're going to have to trust them. What have you learned during this phase for Checkmate about bringing those people in and then letting go a little bit? Because you're not going to accelerate any organization unless you bring in those players and you let them run. Yeah. No. It's where where I've learned and where I've shifted uh, my management style. 
I wouldn't say it's micromanagement, but I think it is um, oversight um, uh, with transparency. And so where I had to learn and adapt is you're right, there are the business can't grow if I'm the bottleneck. And so a lot of decisions that were getting made at a partnership level where is this a good partner to pursue or what are the next steps? You really have to let the person run. And a lot of the early BD side of it, we were still learning. And so our product that we're selling, we're constantly iterating. And so having them, uh, whoops, sorry, Siri's talking to me. Um, and so having them uh, really just be able to send those emails, really be able to uh, you know come back to you and just tell you the summary of like what they've learned um, and I don't have to be a part of that, I think has been instrumental. It's interesting you brought up transparency as well. Um, I have found the hard way early on, I wasn't completely transparent. No, I didn't, uh, when I say that, nobody lied to our employees, but sometimes we said, well, you know, we're, we're trying to raise capital, can't tell them this, can't tell them that just yet, don't want to scare them. But later I found that actually full transparency about what the business was going through, you know, you would be surprised how many of them, you know, were, you know, were inspired and you could also tell who was really in and who was really out and who maybe should be working at Apple because they're never gonna go through financing rounds and the stress that that brings and sitting there on the edge of survival at times. But I found that later, you know, my first couple, uh, you know, rotations with it, I was less transparent because I thought I was protecting people from certain realities. Later, I found out that more transparent was better because it helped separate those who were really in and could accept that and those who really maybe had a, a personality or a cultural needs, they should be in a larger, full-grown, stable organization. How have you managed that line? Because I'm yet to meet an entrepreneur that hasn't said, oh, I've experienced that. What have you felt? How have you guys reacted at Checkmate? No, I'm, <laughs> sorry, Siri started talking to me through halfway. So um, do you mind repeating the last uh, 10 seconds? Apologies. It's the COVID world we live in. Say again. Sorry, it, uh, Siri started talking to me. My watch started going off, so I missed the last ten seconds of oh. of, of the question. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, you know, it, it's Siri and your wife, I get it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I say, in terms of transparency, I say I learned the hard way with early organizations mm -hmm. where I wasn't as transparent about things. I thought I was protecting people maybe from the stress of a mm -hmm. fundraising uh. was coming up, and if we don't get the fundraising, we're only four months from. From, from stress and being out of money. Later I found out just being transparent with the, with the core team, maybe even down a couple levels, because it helped identify people that said, hey, I know we gotta raise money, but I'm in. I'm a real believer, I'm here for the vision. And other people who maybe were like, ah, I don't know if I can handle this. And maybe they should be back at Apple or Google or full established companies because they didn't just, they didn't have the yeah. stomach. They, they wanted to be part of a startup because they said, hey, someday we have an IPO and I make all this money, but they really didn't have the stomach for the journey. And I found being more transparent was so helpful to identify people. How have you experienced it? Because I'm yet to meet an entrepreneur that hasn't said, yep, I've learned. Yeah, uh, transparency at this stage of a business, it is extremely risky. Um, we don't hoodwink anyone. We very much tell it how it is. Um, for us internally, we share all our financial metrics to the team. We do uh, monthly, if not quarterly, um, you know, updates and really you know, understand burn and where we're at. We are hyper-reflective as well. So we've been doing user interviews and everyone is privy to those. and. They're pretty brutal at times. Um, we know we need to get a lot better in different aspects of our business, but it all makes us rally around a problem and we want to solve it together. Um, I think at the hiring and inception stage, you really have to uh, go that extra mile to either vet or give some you know, really tough scenarios because uh, startups are a grind and you have to wear a lot of hats and roles evolve and change. And so I think everyone we've hired you know, what we said we thought they were going to be doing is not exactly what they're doing now. And 
Um, most, well, everyone's risen to the occasion that we've we've hired, but it's just being transparent that you know we're still figuring things out. But these are our guiding principles, and so you know as long as we're moving towards those ultimate goals, um, then what we're doing is valuable. Uh, so that's how we like to lead is through through that kind of north star method. Love it. So two topics, and then we'll we'll wrap here. Culture. What is the culture of Checkmate? Because when people start companies, a lot of times they say, this is the culture we want. And then later you'll find out the reality of the culture you get and, and what the reality of it is. How have you established the culture and what is that culture at Checkmate? Yeah, um, it's interesting because that's one um, soft skill that I think is not really taught a lot at other businesses is around forming and establishing culture. Fortunately, we've had some really great investors and leaders around us. Um, one person who's been um, starting to do a mentor on more of the culture side is a man, Tim Kendall. Um, he was CEO of Pinterest and president of Pinterest. He was also at Meta um, in the early days. And so uh, we've also learned from other people like Brex, for instance, we have some of their leaders as investors they describe their culture as a team, which is you cheer for your team if they're doing well. If they're not, we're going to have a, a hard conversation. For us, um, we we are a mix between family and a team. Um, we are so small and nimble, and we spend so much time together um, that I truly love everyone that um, I work with. We are outcomes based, so you know if you want to go work out in the middle of the day, that's totally fine. Um, so I think we really rally around problems and then solving it. Um, so that's how we build it. We are also very casual. I think we've taken the Australian stride um, where we wear t-shirts and we like to go to the beach and we'll go for a concert um, together. And so um, I think uh, creating you know meaningful relationships and really truly being um, you know, honestly ourselves um, has made communication a lot more fluid. I love the concept of doing things together, going to the beach, grabbing everybody's plus ones and your dogs and going out and just kind of having fun and truly establishing the sense of family um, and grabbing a concert together. There's a lot of that that happens at Valuetainment and I think it's incredibly valuable to build, to build those bonds. Okay, last yeah. bit. You've done this more than once. So what are a couple lessons or learning that you can offer to entrepreneurs that are making the step with a new startup and advice for those that maybe are a couple years into it and you know it's going to be successful. In other words, you haven't died. You've got your, your initial customers, you're selling to them, you're actually turning something of a profit. To those two groups, because you have a perspective, what advice would you give the ones that are at the earliest point of startup, probably scared to death, trying to raise money, friends and family, bootstrapping, all that, and then what advice do you give the ones who maybe on that third anniversary, you know it's working and you're moving along. What advice would you give to them since you've got such a great perspective based on your career? Yeah, um, I mean, there's so many ways that I guess we could tackle this, but I think two aspects of it. Um, people have always given me my opportunities in life. So surround yourself with really quality people, um, I think. That is both, you know, in partnership world, but also with people you want to work with, uh, people you want to uh, emulate or you're inspired by. Um, follow good people. Um, you know, being, you know, really bright and gifted um, is one thing, but I think really just um, learning and being open to experiences has put me in really good stead. Um, and then two, something that people don't necessarily talk about as much is keep healthy. Go for a run. I think stress is really, um, it's a roller coaster. And if there's a hard decision or a hard conversation, something that helps me is going for a run or yoga or, or a surf or anything like that. It gives you perspective. Everything seems like the end of the world at one point. And if you just put it in perspective, um, I think I get personal clarity. Um, and I think it also helps uh, me communicate with our other team members in probably a more relaxed manner when. Um, it might not be going as well or it might be going really well. So um, I think looking after yourself in, in both capacities is, is really um, invaluable. 
Excellent. Okay, so for people to use uh, Checkmate, it's go to joincheckmate.com, correct? That's right. Yeah, joincheckmate.com. Uh, give in us your a own, go. <laughs> what do they do when they get there, and how do they best take advantage of it, in your words? Yeah, if you're an iPhone, so mobile user, go to join Checkmate, um, install the app. Hopefully our onboarding is seamless enough that you'll enable the extension and get brought into our ecosystem in an app. Um, we will be there when you shop on Safari on your mobile. So once you install us, um, hopefully we'll help you save some money and find some new products. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy and please find me if there's any product issues, we are more than willing to um, listen and learn. Um, so thank you in advance. Well, we thank you so much and we'd love to stay in touch with you as the journey continues. Please check us out, uh, the Vault Conference and Valuetainment, because we are all about entrepreneurs. You've done this more than once. And so um, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate this advice, which I think is going to be useful to, to other entrepreneurs around the world, whether they're running a t-shirt company in Berlin or a tech company in S Silicon Valley. They all benefit from learning from people like you that have walked the path before. So thank you so much, Harry, for being here. And best of luck to you and Checkmate. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, that was great. What a great guy, Harry Dixon. Great to hear from him and what's going on at Checkmate. And now, third segment of the BizDoc podcast is going to be a case study. So I will meet you in Studio B. Okay, okay, okay. We are in Studio B for the third segment. Now, I just said I was going to do a case study and talk a little bit about corporate partnership. The corporate partnership I'm going to talk about is Goldman Sachs, MasterCard, and Apple that led to the Apple Card. Remember the Apple Card? They've been talking about the Apple Card. Get the Apple Card. Put the Apple Card on your phone. Use that to pay for all your apps and your subscriptions. Maybe get a subscription to something like Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated or whatever, all of that. This is about the birth of the Apple Card. The Apple Card was born in 2019. Goldman Sachs won the deal to use MasterCard's uh, payment system to provide the Apple Card to you and me. That's when it was launched. But what's interesting is Goldman Sachs wasn't in the consumer card business previously. In 2016, they had announced Marcus, which was a consumer banking brand. Goldman Sachs was an investment banker, high-end you know, clientele, big-time stuff. They weren't down in the trenches doing consumer banking. Amex, American Express, and JP Morgan had already been talking to Apple about being the card. But at the last minute, Goldman Sachs called Apple and swooped in and said, we want to be the partner. We want to do it. And our Marcus brand is us getting into consumer. Guess what? Goldman Sachs may have been a pioneer in investment banking and IPOs and wealth management and all those things, but they did not have more than a few years of experience since the launch of Marcus in 16. I'll get back to that in a minute because it turns out Apple wasn't working with Goldman Sachs. They were working for a division, a department of Goldman Sachs that felt more like a fintech financial technology startup. So let's see how it played out and the lessons for you and me on how we can avoid these kind of mistakes in our own partnerships. Because there's lessons you can use, whether you've got a t-shirt company in Berlin or you're trying to build a technology company in Silicon Valley. Step one, you have a great launch and you announce that the card, 0% on the iPhone. You could use it you know, for your iPhone, pay 0%. Unfortunately, after that wonderful announcement, Things, things hit a little bump in the road early on. Tim Cook was trying to get an Apple card for him and he decided to go through the process to see what it'd be like for consumers and they denied him a card. They wouldn't let Tim Cook get a card. And then they came back and said, no, no, it was our fraud control. People impersonate you. But nonetheless, those things happen and if you want NBA players, LeBron James and Lionel Messi and all kinds of people like that to get an Apple card, yet the, all the celebrities are gonna be denied, that meant that their systems weren't ready to handle consumers, celebrities, and everybody in between. Hit a bump. Then a technology CEO was approved for a card. His wife went in for a card, but the, what they approved her for was a far smaller number. And he said, wait a minute, there's gender bias here. There's gender bias. 
you, you, why would you have this? We're on the same credit. We're, we're married. What's going on here? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We're trying to figure this out. That was on Goldman Sachs. Apple was not happy about it. So a couple bumps in the road, even though Tim Cook is out saying, this is the most successful launch of a credit card ever. And now it's the Apple card on your phone. Let me flip around here and keep going. So then we have the gender bias. And in 2020, they said, in addition to 0%, if you buy your iPhone on the Apple card, 0% financing. Well, beginning of 2020, about a year after the launch, they're like, guess what? You can buy a Mac, you can buy an iPad, you can buy AirPods, and those will be 0% financing too. Now you're gonna notice something in there. If it's 0% financing, that means Goldman Sachs is not making money on that part of it. Keep watching. Then all of a sudden, Goldman Sachs is saying, hey, uh, we have far more disputes and customer care calls and things happening than we ever would have envisioned. You know who knew that was gonna happen? You know who had been negotiating? Amex and JP Morgan, who knew about credit cards and knew how to do that, and they were on top of it. But Goldman Sachs swooped in to win that deal. Guess what? Learning number one, that's how we can tell that inside Goldman Sachs, it was more of a fintech startup than a highly experienced group of credit card professionals inside of an organization like Amex, who's been doing cards for Delta Airlines and so many others for so many years. They know how to do partnerships and JP Morgan. Well, the Apple kept pushing ahead and there was a culture class going on because JP Morgan and Amex understood credit cards how to do it, but Goldman Sachs less so much, and suddenly Apple saying, hey, we wanna do the Apple card family. Just like you have the family phone for Apple, you can give a phone for your spouse, phone for your kid, put one account on it, everybody's buying apps, everybody's getting iTunes family plan, whatever it is you're getting. They wanted the Apple card to be on there to be used by many people, and they got what they wanted. The Apple Card family was launched. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs is in the background kind of struggling. Let me give you some numbers. Apple originally told them to expect 5 million cards in the first year, year and a half. Later, they came and said, you need to prepare for 10 million cards. So Goldman built all the infrastructure that they needed, more investment, more investment, to get to those 10 million cards. But at the end of the first year, all the reports I saw said they only launched 3 million cards. But Goldman had spent the money in advance being ready for 10. They would get to 10, but not for a couple years. Another example of where Goldman's experience just wasn't there, but Apple was looking for slick, strong partnership because everything on that iPhone is very slick and easy to use, and they wanted the credit card part of it to be equally slick and easy. Well, we keep going here. Apple adds Apple savings at the beginning in 2022, and suddenly I think it was a billion dollars came in in very short order, and they overloaded the systems at Goldman Sachs. People said they couldn't transfer money out to then pay for things after getting into the savings account that I think it was a little over 4%, so it was a pretty good, pretty good rate you were receiving. And suddenly people said, I can't get anybody on the phone. I can't get my money out. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a savings account, but it's like trapped. Well, Apple sure didn't like that because that was more inconvenience for the Apple consumers that were getting Apple phones, getting Apple cards to put on their Apple phone and to use for other purposes. Then the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau steps in and says, we need to investigate what's going on with Goldman Sachs because we're getting so many calls from consumers. They're all upset and everything. This is not good. Well, that brings us to this year. The beginning of this year, all of the words and excuses and everything of the crisis, the crisis with, that was words and headlines became numbers. Goldman announces that they lost $1 billion on servicing and introducing and investing in the Apple card between two years, 20 to 22. Holy moly, they announced that they had actually lost a billion dollars doing it. Then, that was early in 2023, and then Scott Young, who did the deal, in other words, he was the guy back here apparently that put the deal together with Apple, it just is a little announcement in the media that Scott Young is leaving Goldman Sachs. What happened? Well, this thing is bursting into flames. Goldman Sachs is having problems. The guy that leads the deal is out. Everybody goes, okay, set the stopwatch. They're probably getting out of the business. 
rumors come out. The first rumor was that not only was Goldman Sachs getting out of the, wants to get out of the Apple card, and we'll talk about how they're going to do that, they also announced that they were getting out of Marcus. You see this line here? Boom! And all the way over to here, Goldman Sachs says they're winding down Marcus. So that was a seven year startup inside Goldman Sachs. Hey, we're getting into consumer banking. Nope, we're winding down the whole thing. Well, what are you going to do about Amex? Excuse me, what are you going to do about the Apple card? The answer is today they're rumored to be talking to Amex, who was at the table in the first place back in the day, and now saying to Apple, if you're Amex, hey, look, I don't want to say I told you so, but I told you so. I'm the guy that should be your partner. And Amex is just waiting to take this over. That's what the rumor on the street is. And meanwhile, Apple has the right to hold Goldman Sachs accountable. And Goldman Sachs had even extended the deal, announcing, I think, that the deal went to 2029. So now Goldman Sachs has to get out of a deal where they had committed till 2029. And the MasterCard interchange, they're fine. They're in the middle. They've got a deal, I think, till 2026. MasterCard servicing all this wasn't the problem. It was Goldman Sachs, in other words, MasterCard payment network. So now you've got this thing basically going this way. At the end of the day, you and me and anybody that has an Apple card, ultimately you probably get a new one from Amex after all the smoke clears on this and they get it together. But what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? The lesson is this. If you're going to go into a partnership, you need to get in a partnership with a proven player. Was Goldman Sachs a proven player? Yes. Wait. Yes in financial services. But were they in credit cards? Customer service? Customer banking? No, they weren't. Get into business with somebody who it's a core competency. It's what they do. And what that looks like here is the partner, just like Delta Airlines and other people have found out, the partner should have been Amex. Credit cards is their core competency. It's what they do. From fraud control to co-branded cards to new issuances, it's what they do, which means that they are authenticated that they are authentic capable. What happened here was Apple ended up getting in business with a fintech startup, a little department division inside of Goldman Sachs. You and I can learn the same thing. If you're gonna get in a partnership with somebody, make sure they're proven, make sure it's a core competency, and make sure they can handle the load they're gonna throw at you. And that's the story. And that's how Goldman Sachs has swooped in to win the Apple business six years later is winding it down and the winner is probably going to be Amex who had been at the table in the first place offering credit card strength, core competency, going to come in and save the day. Now people have asked, how did this happen? How did this happen? Well, I found an analyst, uh, really interesting, David Robertson that writes for the Nielsen Report and I'm going to read his quote. No commercial bank that's experienced in the credit card business was going to give Apple the same terms as Goldman Sachs did to win that deal. Well, there you have an analyst in banking knows what he's talking about that said Goldman did a sweet deal to get into the business. And seven years later, that sweet deal turned sour and they're out. That's a case study for this week. I hope it was informative to you. Let's go back to the main stage and wrap up. Boy, that was fun. I'm back here on main stage. I love case studies and the one we just did on Apple and Goldman Sachs, falling out of love, great lessons about partnerships for you and me. This week, boy, the stats were great, the CEO interview was great, and then a segment on the case study. That's the way we'll be doing it every week. So much to offer, so much to give you here at Valuetainment, and there is a great event where we've got even more for you. The Vault Conference coming up in Fort Lauderdale, right by the airport, actually in Hollywood, Florida, at the Diplomat Hotel, August 30th to September 2nd. These guys behind me are going to be there. Tom Brady talking about leadership and winning championships with different teams. There's a message in there for you as you go through different people on your company. Also, Will Gadara talking about 11 Madison Park, this amazing restaurant that he drove to be number one in its industry. And, of course, Mike Tyson over there, <laughs> that I love listening to because he talks about strategy getting into the ring. There is more to it than met the eye. Vault Conference, Patrick Bet David hosting, talking about strategy, talking about sales, talking about marketing, talking about leadership, 
organizations and great speakers too. If you haven't made plans to be here, be here for the Vault Conference. So much to learn for your business and there may be some uh, promotions right now that allow you a little bit of a discount to bring your staff. So check it out here at the Vault Conference at the Valuetainment.com website. You can find out all about that. Well, we'll see you next week. I am Tom Melzer with the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you.